Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is the hidden problem with nuclear black markets. In previous lectures, we've talked about the problems that AQ Khan caused the nonproliferation regime. After Khan finished developing the Pakistani nuclear weapon, he created a black market and had a whole bunch of customers. As a consequence, during his term as head of the IAEA, Mohammed el Baradei had to spend enormous amounts of time locating where all of this material was going and trying to intercept it. But the theory of nuclear negotiations that we've covered so far presents a bit of a problem with the straightforward interpretation about why black markets are bad for nonproliferation. In the game that we've been exploring so far, the opponent begins by offering a concession to the potential proliferator. The potential proliferator accepts those concessions and does not build a nuclear weapon, rejects and fights a war under the status quo distribution of power, or thanks the opponent for the concessions and builds a nuclear weapon anyway. And if the potential proliferator builds, then the opponent chooses whether to fight a preventive war. The result of this game has been agreements. This dashed line represents what the distribution of the policy in dispute would be like if the potential proliferator were to acquire a nuclear weapon. It looks like it's fairly advantageous to the proliferator and not so great for the opponent. To avoid this outcome, the opponent strikes a deal with the potential proliferator up front. The agreement roughly matches what the potential proliferator would expect to receive if it developed nuclear weapons. But the opponent doesn't have to offer that full amount. It can steal a little bit more for itself and draw the border at where that solid line is. Everything in between the dashed and the solid line is the extra stuff the opponent can steal. The reason that the potential proliferator is okay with this is that by accepting the agreement and not getting as much as it would if it were to develop nuclear weapons, it's also avoiding having to pay the costs associated with those weapons. So it's happy as well. One of the key assumptions I've highlighted in this model is that there is a static nuclear capacity. In other words, the potential proliferator's cost of developing nuclear weapons does not fluctuate wildly over time. It stays still. Thus, if we assume that there's just a black market out there, and it's stable, then there's no reason that the parties should not negotiate an agreement rather than build nuclear weapons. As a result, it is not immediately obvious why the presence of nuclear black markets causes countries to pursue proliferation behaviors. To be clear, it is obvious why countries like the United States don't like nuclear black markets. One of the things that determines what the deal looks like is the cost of developing nuclear weapons. As that cost gets larger, the opponent can draw the deal further away from the dashed line. That's because more expensive weapons look less attractive, and so the opponent can steal more from the potential proliferator without the potential proliferator preferring to develop nuclear weapons instead. Thinking about this logically, if a nuclear black market makes it cheaper to develop nuclear weapons, then the way the opponent has to respond to get the potential proliferator not to develop nuclear weapons is make more concessions. So of course opponents don't like nuclear black markets. To be able to maintain the status quo and sustain non-proliferation, they have to give more, and they don't like doing that. Getting back to that assumption about a static ability to construct nuclear weapons, in practice, black markets are inherently unstable. We've talked about the unraveling of the AQCon network when a shipment to Libya was intercepted. What that means from a potential proliferator's perspective is that the nuclear black market could be here today, but gone tomorrow. Taking stock, we should build in that sort of instability into the model. To do that, we're going to make a couple of changes. First, if the potential proliferator accepts an agreement, it's not game-ending. That'll just be the share of the good that's in dispute for the time being. And then afterward, they'll repeat the interaction the next day. In between acceptance and the renegotiation, however, there's going to be some chance that the black market disappears. The effect of the black market disappearing in terms of the payoffs for the players 
is that the cost of nuclear weapons is going to be cheaper when the black market is around and more expensive when the black market disappears. Phrased this way, you can see how this is going to cause some bargaining failure. The leftmost of the solid lines is what the agreement would look like if we had a static and cheap cost to develop nuclear weapons, because the black market will always be there and the country can always pursue that black market if it wants to develop a nuclear weapon. The second line is how negotiations would unfold once that black market disappears. The opponent can demand more of the good for itself and give less to the potential proliferator because the potential proliferator now has a higher cost to develop nuclear weapons. If the likelihood that the nuclear black market will disappear is high, then the potential proliferator prefers building nuclear weapons while they are cheap. That's because it wants to lock in a good deal for itself at a relatively low price, knowing that if it were to wait around, that opportunity would be lost. And yes, the potential proliferator can still get some concessions later on, but the concessions are not going to be as great, precisely because the cost of nuclear weapons has jumped up so high. This is another manifestation of a commitment problem. The outcome that we observe is inefficient. The potential proliferator builds nuclear weapons, so all of those costs go to waste. There's no direct benefit to paying that price, only an indirect benefit in what comes afterward. Unfortunately, the efficient alternative is not possible. The opponent cannot credibly commit to the level of concessions necessary to convince the potential proliferator not to develop nuclear weapons. That is, the opponent cannot credibly promise concessions commensurate with a cheap route to proliferation, because once that black market is gone, the potential proliferator only has a high cost option. And at that point, the opponent only needs to provide minimal concessions to the potential proliferator to convince the potential proliferator not to build. That in turn prevents the potential proliferator from being able to credibly promise to accept concessions, even if they are fairly generous up front, because it knows that eventually the opponent will stop offering such concessions, and it wants to lock in a good rate while it can. With all of that explained, we can now circle back to the main point of this lecture. Deals would work if the black market would remain constant. We're not having a fluctuating cost to develop nuclear weapons at that point. It's the instability of the black market that causes the commitment problem. And so black markets are bad not because necessarily they exist. Their existence only determines who gets what portion of the good. The inefficiency from a black market is caused because it might go away. And because it might go away, the potential proliferator feels like it needs to build nuclear weapons while it still can at a cheap price. That's it for this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.